Hello, and welcome to Revelations in Grace. I'm John Paul, and today we're continuing to identify the events and experiences prophesied in the book of Revelation. Now, Revelation concerned events that were about to take place soon after the book was written. We find this out in the first few verses throughout the book, and especially in the final chapter, where it repeatedly states that these events were about to take place and that Jesus was about to return. Revelation was written in apocalyptic style, and apocalyptic style portrayed the destruction of empires and kingdoms in cosmic world-ending language. And the events of the first century were so tragic that it did warrant such language used to express it. In fact, in Matthew 24, Jesus said that this was, would be one of the most tragic times in all of history, and there would never again be something as tragic as it. He says that in verse 21, for then there will be great suffering, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, nor ever will be. And he prophesied that in his generation. So we're reading some of the, some of the saddest parts of human history. And, uh, and of course, this apocalyptic language um, was deserved to describe it. So we're going to be trying to identify how these prophecies were fulfilled in that first century, looking at the language and then what it likely symbolized in that time. And we're going to start with Revelation 16, where the beast kingdom was thrown into darkness. In Revelation 16, verses 10 through 11, we read, The fifth poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was darkened. They gnawed their tongues because of the pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. They still didn't repent of their works. And as I discussed in two previous videos about the sea beast and the ten horns, we identified this beast as, and it was the sea beast mentioned in Revelation 13. It symbolized both Rome and the Jewish zealots. And remarkably, both fell into chaos and suffered from these plagues. Rome experienced moral darkness and turmoil during a year-long civil war that erupted after Emperor Nero's suicide. So Nero stabbed himself uh, in the throat, and then that broke out a civil war throughout Rome on who would take power next. And in addition, Mount Vesuvius, the volcano in Italy, it erupted in 79 AD and caused an actual darkness to fall over the whole empire. Uh, the volcano smoke, it blocked out the sun and the stars, and it even reached as far as Egypt. And Rome, after this, faced a devastating plague, which was likely caused by the acid rain from the eruption. Uh, Roman historian Cassius Dio wrote, Indeed, the amount of dust taken all together was so great that some of it reached Africa and Syria and Egypt, and it also reached Rome, filling the air overhead and darkening the sun. There, too, no little fear was occasioned. That lasted for several days, since the people did not know and could not imagine what had happened, but like those close at hand, believed that the whole world was being turned upside down, that the sun was disappearing into the earth, and that the earth was being lifted into the sky. These ashes now did the Romans no great harm at the time, though later they brought a terrible pestilence upon them. So the Romans suffered from this pestilence. Their empire was literally darkened. And this is combined with that civil war that took place after Nero's suicide. And most people thought it would be the end of Rome, that that was the final days of the Roman Empire. Now, the Jewish zealots, they also endured dark times during the siege and before the siege of Jerusalem. They divided into three factions. They had three competing mes false messiahs, and they warred with each other, and they destroyed each other's food supplies. And historian Josephus, he describes the pestilential destruction that was caused by the unburied dead that filled the city, writing, And indeed, the multitude of carcasses that lay in heaps one upon another was a horrible sight, and produced a pestilential stench, which was an hindrance to those that would make sallies out of the city and fight the enemy. And then in another place, he says, For they were come up from all the country to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and were on a sudden shut up by an army, which at the very first occasion so great a straightness among them, that there came a pestilential destruction upon them, and soon afterwards such a famine as destroyed them more suddenly. So during this war, the Jews didn't allow their dead to be buried, and it caused all these diseases to come upon them. 
So just as foretold in Deuteronomy 28 when God lists out the curses for disobedience to the law, this was fulfilled in those plagues. Remember in verse 27 of Deuteronomy, um, it says, The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt and with tumors and scabs and itch of which you cannot be healed. And this took place on the Romans and upon the Jewish zealots during this war. So Jerusalem was struck with the sixth plague of boils from Egypt. And this would also fulfill Revelation 16, 2, where it talks about how harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast. So that is one tragic event and how it was likely fulfilled in history. Another event that was prophesied was signs in the heavens and on earth. Jesus and Joel prophesied that signs would appear in the stars and on earth before the destruction of Jerusalem. In Luke 21, it says, There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on earth dismay among the nations, bewildered by the roaring of the sea and the surging of the waves. Men will faint from fear and anxiety over what is coming upon the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And in Acts 2, uh, Peter is quoting from Joel, who's saying, saying this from God. I will show wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. And in Matthew 24, verse 29, it reads, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. So in fulfillment of Jesus and Joel's words, there were several cosmic events that did occur in the skies before the Jewish war between 66 and 70 AD. And Cassius Dio wrote about an event that occurred in 69 AD. I'm in book 64, chapter or section 8, you might say. Um, and this is what he said. While he was behaving in this way, evil omens occurred. A comet was seen, and the moon, contrary to precedent, appeared to suffer two eclipses, being obscured on the fourth and on the seventh day. Also, people saw two suns at once, one in the west, <laughs> weak and pale, and one in the east, brilliant and powerful. On the capital, many huge footprints were seen, presumably of some spirits that had descended from it. The soldiers who had slept there on the night in question said that the temple of Jupiter had opened of itself with great clangor and that some of the guards had been so terrified that they fainted. So these are cosmic events happening in the stars before that final siege of Jerusalem. And in fact, this seems an awful lot like a fulfillment of Isaiah 30, verse 26. And Isaiah prophesied, Moreover, the light of the moon will be like the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be seven times brighter, like the light of the seven of seven days. So maybe what Cassius Dio was seeing, what he described as two suns in the sky at once, one weak and one strong, was actually the moon and the sun uh, being much brighter than they normally are in fulfillment of Isaiah 30. So that's a really interesting connection there. Also, Sefer Yosephon, he was a anonymous Jew living in the 10th century. He wrote concerning events that took place during Passover of 66 AD. He writes, Now it happened after this that there was seen from above over the Holy of Holies for the whole night the outline of a man's face, and the like of whose beauty had never been seen in all the land, and his appearance was quite awesome. That's a remarkable event. So they saw this outline of a man's face over the temple and the stars uh, that was exceedingly beautiful. So that, that's a, another powerful and remarkable event that took place before the, just before this war began, like literally days before it began. Josephus also described remarkable signs in the stars and on earth that occurred between uh, and Passover between roughly late April to early May of 66 AD. I'm in book six, chapter five, section three, and this is what he wrote. Thus, were the miserable people persuaded by these deceivers, and such as belied God himself, while they did not attend nor give credit to the signs that were so evident, and did so plainly foretell their future desolation. But like men infatuated, without either eyes to see or minds to consider, 
did not consider the denunciations that God made to them. Thus there was a star, resembling a sword, which stood over the city, and a comet that continued for a whole year. Thus also before the Jews' rebellion, and before those commotions which preceded the war, when the people were come in great crowds to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on the eighth day of the month Xantichus, or in the Jewish calendar, Nisan, and at the ninth hour of the night, so great a light shone around the altar and the holy house that it appeared to be bright daytime, which light lasted for half an hour. This light seemed to be a good sign to the unskillful, but was so interpreted by the sacred scribes as to pretend those events that followed immediately upon it. At the same festival also was a heifer, that's a cow, and as she was led by the high priest to be sacrificed, brought forth a lamb in the midst of a temple. So a cow gave birth to a lamb. That's remarkable. Moreover, the eastern gate of the inner court of the temple, which was of brass and vastly heavy and had been with difficulty shut by 20 men and rested upon a basis armed with iron and had bolts fastened very deep into the firm floor, which was there made of one entire stone, was seen to be opened of its own accord about the sixth hour of the night. Now those that kept watch in the temple and came here upon running to up to the captain of the temple and told him of it, who then came up thither and not without great difficulty was able to shut the gate again. This also appeared to the vulgar to be a very happy prodigy, as if God did thereby open them the gate of happiness. But the men of learning understood it, that the security of their holy house was dissolved of its own accord, and that the gate was opened for the advantage of their enemies. So these publicly declared that this signal foreshewed the desolation that was coming upon them. So just preceding the war, there were all these miraculous signs that were taking place both in the sky and on earth that warned of the coming destruction. And unfortunately, these Jewish zealots were too foolish to realize it and even interpreted them as favorable signs. But the their priests and the more skillful people understood that it was a warning of their desolation that was about to come. And this would accurately fulfill these prophecies about wonders in the sky and on the earth uh, and in the sun, moon, and stars that took place before the coming of the day of the Lord. So that that's a remarkable piece of history. Next, we're going to discuss the four angels at the Euphrates. Revelation describes four angels bound at the Euphrates that would be released to kill a third of mankind. In Revelation 9, verses 14 through 15, it writes, Saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Free the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. The four angels were freed who had been prepared for that hour and day and month and year so that they might kill one-third of mankind. Now this word for angels and the four angels, it's the Greek word angel, angeloi, and it's translated here as angels, but it can also be translated as messengers or God's delegates. In scripture, this term sometimes refers to humans rather than supernatural beings. And here are several scriptures that, that translate the same word and refers to a human rather than to an angel. In fact, in Matthew 11, Jesus is talking about John, and he's quoting from a prophecy in Malachi 3.1 concerning John the Baptist. And he writes, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. And if we look at that verse in Bible Hub, and we go down to where that word messenger is, it's the word angelon. And that word angelon does mean a messenger or an angel. And sometimes it refers to humans, like John the Baptist, for instance. And other times it does refer to a supernatural messenger of God, like an angel. Um, so it's what I believe is happening here is this sixth angel. Up here, it's a literal angel. It's actually an angel. And these four angels here were actually humans. Um, and we're going to discuss that here. Um, Daniel Morace uh, did some fantastic research on this and discovered that these four angels likely represented the generals of the four Roman legions that were uh, stationed at the Euphrates before the Jewish war. And he wrote,
During the siege of Jerusalem in AD 70, there were four Roman legions under Titus's command, Legio V, Macedonica, Legio X, Fratensis, Legio XII, Fulminata, and Legio XV, Apollinaris. The four angels bound at the Euphrates appears to refer to the generals of these four legions. The fact that these four legions are said to be bound at the Euphrates also appears to be an historical Easter egg, as Titus's four legions were all bound at the Euphrates just three years before the outbreak of the Jewish revolt. In AD 30, 63, at the conclusion of the Roman Parthian War, all four of Titus's Roman legions were stationed at the Euphrates. In AD 63, 12, Fulminata was stationed in Zeugma, at the banks of the Euphrates. 10, Fratensis was left to guard Cappadocia, again presumably to guard the Parthian border at the Euphrates. And that year, 5, Macedonica, and 15, Apollinaris crossed the Euphrates into Armenia in response to the Parthian threat. So this is really interesting. These were the Romans that, these were the legions that, um, did destroy a third of mankind. We're going to discuss that in just a second, but it looks like these four angels or four Roman generals were stationed at the Euphrates and were released during this war to destroy a third of mankind. Now, the way that was fulfilled is quite interesting. Uh, after multitudes of Jews came from all nations into Jerusalem for Passover, the Romans locked them inside and began their siege. Josephus said that a significant number of people, not fewer in number than three millions, visited Jerusalem during Passover at the start of the war. If the same number attended the feast in 70 AD, which was a likely scenario, those killed in Jerusalem, which he says were 1,100,000 or just over 1 million, would be a third of its population. Josephus writes, now the number of those that were carried captive during this whole war was collected to be 97,000 and was the number of those that perished during the whole siege 1,100,000, the greater part of whom were indeed of the same nation with the citizens of Jerusalem, but not belonging to the city itself. For they were come up from all the country to the Feast of Unleavened Bread and were on a sudden shut up by the army, which at very first occasioned so great a straightness among them that there came a pestilential destruction upon them, and soon afterwards such a famine as destroyed them more suddenly. So roughly three million Jews were attending the feast in Jerusalem during the siege, and roughly 1.1 million of them were killed by the Romans, which would have fulfilled the prophecy that roughly a third of mankind was killed by these four angels at the Euphrates. And of, of course, they were killed by these four Roman legions. So that's a powerful fulfillment of that. And again, apocalyptic language, it describes the destruction of empires and kingdoms in this cosmic world ending language. So you might read it as if it's a third of all mankind on the earth when really it's describing the destruction of Jerusalem and the kingdom of Jerusalem and, uh, and the kingdom of Israel and how a third of their empire was destroyed. In Revelation 16, 21, we also read about great hail, about a talent and weight that comes down out of heaven upon the men. And it says that men blaspheme God on account of the plague of hail, for the plague of it is exceedingly severe. And this is quite fascinating because before the destruction of the temple, this prophecy was fulfilled when the Romans hurled white stones, sometimes mixed with fire, and they weighed up to a talent into Jerusalem. And we can actually see pictures of these rocks here. These are some of the rocks believed to have been cast by the Roman catapult. So they were these gigantic rocks weighing about a talent, and they um, they were raining down, and they were white in color. In fact, Josephus describes these in um, Book 6, I believe. It says, These engines that all the legions had ready prepared for them were admirably contrived, but still more extraordinary, ones belonged to the 10th legion. And those that threw darts and those that threw stones were more forcible and larger than the rest, by which they not only repelled the excursions of the Jews, but drove those away that were upon the walls also. Now the stones that were cast were of the weight of a talent and were carried two furlongs and further. The blow they gave was no way to be sustained, not only by those that first stood in the way, but by those that were beyond them for a great space. 
As for the Jews, as they at first watched the coming of the stone, for it was a white color, and could therefore not only be perceived by the great noise it made, but could also be seen before it came by its brightness. And Josephus also describes these stones in the battle of Jadapada and how some of them were on fire, and he describes their destructive power and how they cause these little mini earthquakes. So this would have nicely fulfilled this prophecy about great hail. We have white stones weighing a talent falling down on Jerusalem, which would have nicely fulfilled this verse in Revelation 16, 21. And we can see how, you know, Jerusalem had committed spiritual adultery with God by crucifying their Messiah and following Caesar and worshiping other gods and, and denying Jesus. And you can see that they were stoned for their spiritual adultery against God. That was the punishment God laid out as uh, the curse for disobedience. If someone was caught in adultery, they needed to be stoned. And so Jerusalem was stoned for their spiritual adultery. And we also learned in Revelation that Jerusalem was like Sodom and Gomorrah. And just as Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by fire coming down from heaven, some of these rocks on fire destroyed um, Jerusalem in the same manner. So we see how how that was fulfilled in history. So those those are extraordinary events. In Revelation eleven thirteen it says, And in that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. Seven thousand were killed in the quake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. And there was kind of an earthquake when these stones were falling on the city. They would cause a great shaking of the ground when they hit the ground. Now, um, Daniel Morais calculated that the temple area was roughly a tenth of the space of the city. You can see his uh, his calcul. He actually did the math on this and found that this temple area was a tenth of the space of Jerusalem at that time. So, in fulfillment of this prophecy, when the temple fell, roughly a tenth of the city was collapsing. In fulfillment of this verse, that's really powerful. It also says that seven thousand were killed in the quake. At the time, this temple fell, and they and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God in heaven. Well, in August of 70 AD, when the Jewish temple was destroyed, Josephus estimated that around 10,000 Jews were killed. So maybe this was an overestimation. Maybe it was really around 7,000. Um, but these were killed in this quake caused by these stones falling on the city. And, uh, and this temple collapsed. A tenth of the city collapsed. And this would nicely fulfill this prophecy of the sixth trumpet uh, of a tenth of the city collapsing and the 7,000 dying. Man, this stuff is really tragic and it's uh, it's difficult to get through, uh, but it it's also fascinating how Revelation was fulfilled in that first century. And we can be really grateful this, uh, this isn't going to happen in our future and that we're under the new covenant, under God's unconditional grace simply by trusting in what Jesus did for us. So uh, we can be thankful that we're not under God's wrath anymore. And that's a wonderful thing. It also prophesies in Revelation 16, 3 about the sea turning into blood. It says, And the second poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood, as of one dead, and every living soul that was in the sea died. And Josephus records a few fulfillments of this verse. In July of 67 AD, he records that the people of Joppa were slaughtered near the Mediterranean Sea, and this is how he describes the scene. But some of them thought that to die by their own swords was lighter than by the sea, and so they killed themselves before they were drowned. Although the greatest part of them were carried by the waves and dashed to pieces against the abrupt part of the rocks, insomuch that the sea was bloody a long way, and the maritime parts were full of dead bodies. For the Romans came upon those that were carried to the shore and destroyed them, and the number of the bodies that were thus thrown out of the sea was 4,200. So if you can imagine 4,200 dead bodies in the sea and bleeding, uh, what color that water is going to be. You can imagine a sea full of blood. Also in September of 67 AD, it says that the Jews from Tarashe were killed in the Sea of Galilee. Josephus wrote, but as many as these were repulsed when they were getting ashore, they were killed by the darts upon the lake, and the Romans leaped out of their vessels and destroyed a great many more upon the land, that one might then see the lake all bloody and full of dead bodies, 
for not one of them escaped. And a terrible stink and a very sad sight there was on the following days over that country. For as for the shores, they were full of shipwrecks and of dead bodies all swelled. And as the dead bodies were inflamed by the sun and putrefied, they corrupted the air insomuch that the misery was not only the object of commiseration to the Jews, but to those that hated them and had been the authors of that misery. This was the upshot of the sea fight. The number of the slain, including those that were killed in the city before, was 6,500. So if you can imagine thousands of these dead bodies in the water and, and swelling and producing this horrible stench and the lake is full of blood, just as Revelation prophesied. And then later on in 79 AD, when Mount Vesuvius erupted, Cassius Dio wrote that it destroyed all fish and birds in that area. It says, while this was going on, an inconceivable quantity of ashes was blown out, which covered both sea and land and filled all the air. It wrought much injury of various kinds, as chance befell, to men and farms and cattle, and in particular it destroyed all fish and birds. So this is another interesting way in which um, all living souls that were in the sea died when the water was turned to blood. Um, so such a tragic event. We also read that the rivers were turned to blood and people were given blood to drink. In verses 4 through 6 of Revelation 16, it reads, The third poured out his bowl into the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, who are and who were, O holy one, because you have judged these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve this. And this was likely fulfilled in February of 68 AD. There was a massacre that occurred in the Jordan River, causing it to flow red with blood. And Josephus wrote, And this because not only the whole country through which they fled was filled with slaughter, and the Jordan could not be passed over by reason of the dead bodies that were in it, but because the lake Asphaltitis, the Dead Sea, was also full of dead bodies that were carried down into it by the river. So this, the river of Jordan was so full of dead bodies that people literally couldn't cross over the river. Um, so this river also flowed red with blood. Now, researcher and blogger Adam Marshock notes that many Jews were pushed into the water by the Romans and drowned. And he notices that when someone drowns, the desperate urge to breathe underwater causes them to swallow water into their lungs. And in this case, as the Jews drowned, they were literally drinking blood in fulfillment of this prophecy in a chillingly literal way. So, I mean, these are horrible, tragic events that were happening. And it's fascinating that we can correlate this history with Revelation and see how they were fulfilled in the first century. But this was a gut-wrenching experience to, to read and to study. And, uh, and I hope you weren't too distressed by reading this. But in summary, we're just going to go back over what we said briefly and remind you of these things. Um, you know, we learn about the throne of the beast being thrown into darkness. And we that happened at Nero's suicide when the civil war broke out. And again, when Mount Vesuvius erupted and there were painful sores and boils on the people, an unprecedented plague in Rome. This also happened on the Jewish zealots when they divided into three uh, factions for their three competing messiahs and they burned each other's food supplies and left their dead unburied. And that caused a terrible pestilence to come upon them. Uh, we hear that there was prophesied signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And in history, we find out that there were miraculous celestial events that Josephus, Sefer Yosephon, and Cassius Dio recorded during the Jewish war. Uh, we read in Revelation 9 about four angels at the Euphrates being released to kill a third of mankind. And when we look in history, we find that four Roman generals led these four uh, legions to siege Jerusalem in which a third of the occupants in that city were destroyed during this war, uh, nicely fulfilling that verse. We read about um, hailstones weighing about a talent falling down on the city, and we find out in history that the Romans cast heavy hailstones about a talent on Jerusalem that were a white color, and that led to the death of thousands. And we find out about a tenth of the city collapsing, and that happened when the temple was destroyed, which occupied roughly a tenth of the city. And as it says, 7,000 people were killed. Josephus estimated that roughly 10,000 people were killed, which may have been an overestimation. 
and would have nicely fulfilled that. We read about the sea and streams turning into blood, and this happened in, happened in several of the battles where thousands of people were slain in the sea and in the rivers so that they flowed red with blood and that people couldn't cross over the river, and some of them were drowned in the river by the Romans and and drank in this blood that was that was prophesied. So these these are tragic events, and these dramatic historical events warranted this apocalyptic language to describe it. Um, because it was just so tragic. And it, I believe it accurately fulfills what Jesus wrote in Matthew, that it was one of the worst times in history. And there's far more worse things that we didn't cover in this video that happened during that war. But uh, but yeah, this is, this is one of the ways that revelation was fulfilled during that time. So uh, I ask that you study and you pray about the things I share and that you do your own research on this. And uh, I hope you've appreciated this video. And if you have, let me know. And uh, in the next video, I hope to discuss who Gog and Magog were and identify those characters in the first century. So thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great day.